started in about 20 seconds. So if you're not in here, you can just click on the little button and it will take you to the link that is on all the lights. So. Carnegie scientists explore the outermost reaches of space, the mysterious depths of the Earth, and the origins and mechanisms of life. Our brilliant and dynamic teams of scientists transform the landscape of discovery with their unbridled passion, insatiable curiosity, and never-ending quest for knowledge. With limited teaching, administrative, and grant pressures, Carnegie scientists concentrate on research and are empowered to go their own way. Our scientists are chosen for unique skills and boldness. Their amazing discoveries, spanning more than a century, demonstrate the power of freedom. Carnegie investigators are intrepid adventurers who pursue their goals even as they mentor and train the next generation of scientists. They are free, free to question, to wonder, to creatively pursue ideas from the vast universe to the subatomic world. Our scientists redefine the pursuit of what's possible for us, our planet, our universe. We explore the past to understand the present and inform the future. Well, good evening, everyone. That's interesting. <laughs> We're going to have a talk soon about volcanoes <laughs> and earthquakes. Um, my name is Matthew Scott. I'm the president of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and I'm here to welcome you. Just make a couple of brief remarks. Uh, we're really happy to have you here, some of you perhaps for the first time in this historic hall. This hall was built in 1935, and like the rest of the building, it was built for science, not for something else, and adapted to science. And you can see some of the history of the institution written in the words around me. Uh, these are fields of science as of, that we were in as of 1935. Many of them we still do. We have uh, six departments that, as you just saw in this video, span this uh, range of space, earth, and life. These are departments that look at the continuum across those areas of science, thinking about how the history of the universe relates to the history of galaxies, solar systems, planets, and how you go from the history of this planet to the history of life on it. So our scientists cover this whole spectrum, and it's been enormous fun for me joining Carnegie uh, two and a half years ago to participate in some of the excitement about that. We have uh, two of the departments here in DC. We have two departments at Stanford University in Palo Alto. We have one department at Johns Hopkins, and we have a department in Pasadena. And then we have outposts at the Synchrotron Argonne National Lab near Chicago. And we have a big group of people working at our telescopes in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. So take a look at our website to learn more about the science we're doing in all these places. I, our scientists are having a lot of fun and they like sharing it with you. Now, as you may know, we also host a series of free public lectures here. Uh, and we also do some public lectures at some of our other departments, including Pasadena and the neighborhood lectures done at our research campus about 20 minutes drive from here. The lectures here are called the Capital Science Evening Lectures and they go on through the year. We do about 10 of them each year. Tonight's program is one of those. It's the third of five that make up the spring 2017 lineup. Our next talk will take place on the 31st of the month, and you can see it up there in the upper left. The speaker is a Carnegie scientist. Some of our talks are by Carnegie scientists. Some of them are by guests, as is the case today. Uh, this Diana, you may notice 
and I didn't notice this initially when I looked at this picture, but that lava right in front of her is glowing orange, which most of us would decide was maybe a reason to go elsewhere, but she doesn't. She loves it there. And I've followed her up active volcanoes, and she's very cautious with her guests, maybe a little less so with herself. Anyway, it should be a very, very interesting talk. So I want to thank our partners tonight, the Council of Scientific Society Presidents and the Cavalier Foundation have partnered with us for some lectures every year. Partly we partner just because we like each other so much. It's really a wonderful, both, all three groups I think are full of interesting people and they like working on projects together and I hope that will expand. Tonight's event is a special event which is really focused on the Cavley tradition and the Cavley person. It's the Fred Cavley Science at the Frontiers lecture. And it's an honor to have Cavley Prize winner George Church, who as you'll see is a fascinating thinker whose work and ideas touch on many aspects of life beyond the specific research topics that he works on. He touches many things and you'll see that. So we're very happy to have him here and we have other very distinguished scientists joining us for the event. So I want to thank also Margaret and Will Hurst. Uh, Will is one of our trustees and the Hursts have been very generous to us in supporting this series of lectures. For a TV, which is a crew hard at work up there, broadcasts very high quality uh, reproductions of these lectures on all the usual media, and you can look at them yourself uh, on our website and on their website. And uh, so if you like the lecture tonight and want to tell other people about it, you can direct them to those sources. We're very grateful to the Hearst for supporting this. And finally, some of you have donated to Carnegie Science uh, tonight on your way in here, and we really are grateful for that. We use those donations for science and for these public programs. And we're, we're really, really grateful for people uh, doing that when they can. So next I'd like to introduce Bob Barsley who is chair of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents, as I said, one of the partners sponsoring tonight's talk. Thank you for coming here. Thank you, Dr. Scott. The Council of Scientific Society Presidents greatly appreciates its collaboration with the Carnegie Institute for Science and our opportunity to be here tonight. We're wrapping up a three-day meeting in Washington, and you can tell who we are by the fact that we have on little badges that will identify us. CSSP is a federation of scientific research scientists whose members work together to promote funding for and understanding of the full range of science and engineering and to advance science and technology leadership. We are delighted to be working with Carolyn Montejo and David Stewerman of the Cavley Foundation to present the Fred Cavley Science at the Frontiers lecture twice each year. Thank you, Carolyn and David, and they're here in the audience also. Before I introduce our speaker, Dr. George Church, I'd like to invite my colleague, Dr. Deborah Bronk, to the stage to present the Carl Sagan Award from the Council of Scientific Society Presidents to this year's awardee, Major General Charles Bolden. for public appreciation of science is given by CSSP to honor those who have become um, accomplished as researchers and educators and as widely recognized magnifiers of the public's understanding of science. The recipient of this year's Carl Sagan Award is Charles Bolden. He's a retired Major General of the United States Marine Corps. During his 14 years as an astronaut, he logged more than 680 hours in space during four space shuttle missions, twice as commander and twice as pilot. He has received many honors, including the Defense Superior Service Medal and the Distinguished Flying Cross, and was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2009. In 2009, Bolden was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the Senate as the 12th NASA Administrator, leading the space agency in its vision to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown for the benefit of humanity. He retired from his distinguished service to NASA in January of this year. His untiring commitment to science has resulted in visionary leadership, 
driving and deepening public understanding and appreciation for the role of science in our society. It is my pleasure to present to you the CSSP 2017 Carl Sagan Award for Public Appreciation of Science to Charles Bolden. forward to hearing George Church, a dear friend. Uh, he's fascinating. That's all I'm going to say because I want to hear him. But I do want to thank CSSP for this recognition. Uh, as I told them this morning, you know, I, I get things like this and they're really, I accept them on behalf of the incredible men and women of NASA and, uh, and other NASA and other science STEM organizations, both in and out of the federal government. What you do, those of you who are in the STEM fields, is absolutely incredible and invaluable and keep up the good work. So George, I'm looking forward to hearing you. I've known better. I, everybody else has had no better luck than I. It's now my distinct honor to introduce Dr. George Church, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and professor of health sciences and technology at Harvard University and at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Dr. Church is director of the U.S. Department of Energy Center on Bioenergy at Harvard and MIT and director of the National Institutes of Health, Science, of Health Center of Excellence in Genomic Science at Harvard. He is also the director of personalgenomics.org, which provides the world's only open access information on the human genome, environmental and trait data, known as GET, G-E-T. Dr. Church is widely recognized for his innovative contributions to genomic science and his many pioneering contributions to chemistry and to biomedicine. In 1984, he developed the first direct genomic sequencing method, which resulted in the first commercial genome sequence, the human pathogen H. pylori, dramatically reducing the cost and time of sequencing genes. This led to his participation in the, fun, in the fun founding of the Human Genome Project in 1984 and the Personal Genome Project in 2005. His career ever since has been a string of revolutionary firsts, not only in genomic sequencing, but as one of the pioneers of CRISPR technologies, synthetic biology, DNA data storage, privacy, safety, and security policies. Now technology and innovations in aging, brain research, and even dark matter and space genetics. His work includes research on organ transplants, endangered, and even extinct species. He is rumored to be working on bringing back the woolly mammoth and on, <laughs> and on large ecosystem gene drives, the subject of his talk tonight. Dr. Church invented the broadly applied concepts of molecular multiplexing and tags, homogenous recombination methods, and array DNA synthesizers. He has co-founded more than 14 bio research, biotech companies, authored over 400 papers, and holds 60 patents. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. He has received dozens of awards, including the American Society for Microbiology Promega Biotechnology Award Research Award and the Heptannual Bauer Award and Prize for Achievement in Science from the Franklin Institute. In 2012, Dr. Church authored the book Regenesis, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. A recent National Geographic story about Dr. Church states that he has made a career of defying the impossible. Time Magazine recognized him earlier this month and named him one of the 100 most influential people of the year. Be sure to read Stephen Colbert's description of him in time if you get a chance. It was quite interesting. <laughs> With that, Dr. Church, please come forward. to go from a crazy idea to reduction of practice and getting it out into society where it can have some impact. And I want to talk about engineering human genomes and environments, which requires we not only engineer, but we have to be able to test and read them. And this is a very interesting story, uh, and it's perhaps you won't see this quite dry, but uh, this, this is factors of 10 on the y-axis. This, this is not only exponential, this is super exponential. This is going 
going faster than Moore's Law, but it keeps getting faster. And so something remarkable happened around 2003 where we, where we started getting, we've now improved the cost, the inequality, of reading and writing DNA by three million fold for reading DNA and a billion fold for writing of short pieces of uh, oligonucleus. Now that's not the same as getting a fully functioning uh, in a medical or agricultural or environmental setting, which is what we'll talk about. What happened in around 2003 is we learned the lessons of uh, Silicon Valley of microscaling and multiplexing, and we just applied them to biology. Uh, maybe a little more than that. Um, so uh, quick audience participation, is human, human genomics useful today? I'll argue probably not. So raise your hands if you have your human genome uh, in your possession. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually, that's some surprise. There are quite a few people. Okay. Um, this is what, what the rest of you are missing out on. Um, it, it is helpful for uh, avoid, uh, preventative medicine, essentially for um, avoiding, and in some communities that practice genetic counseling, almost eliminating it's very serious inherited diseases like Tay-Sachs. It's not fully under appreciated that uh, about 5% of births, even in very uh, wealthy uh, nations, 5% are children that are severely genetically damaged and, they're, and their illness could either result in very early death or lingering um, and, up, and up to a $20 million lifetime cost uh, of that uh, disease. There are, there are late, later steps, this is, you know, pre, in vitro fertilization, prenatal diagnostics, very often results in the dietary change during newborn screening. And then sometimes children have uh, something that's just baffling to medicine, and that's called a medical odyssey or genetic odyssey, where, where the parents go from place to place. They blame themselves until a cause is found. Even if there's not a cure, knowing the cause is very reassuring to the parents, and it results, sometimes results in research, and sometimes, in the case of the Beery twins here, these, uh, these beautiful teenagers uh, um, were misdiagnosed as cerebral palsy. It turned out all they needed was an over-the-counter um, nutritional supplement for dopamine and serotonin pathways. And then finally, there are adult uh, onset diseases, and Angelina Jolie was sort of a very um, helpful and prominently uh, being transparent and disclosing her uh, dealing with cancer. This is just to make sure that no one misunderstands. This was not she detected a lump or that she detected a mammogram positive. This was entirely preventative. She had no cancer. She just had a predisposition. So she reduced her risk from almost 90% to about 5% by preventative surgery. So what about prevention? Is that the future of the bi biomedicine? Well, if it's not reflected in the budgets uh, all the time, this is a pie chart showing uh, one of the national components, of, and, and uh, here 1% of this uh, NCI budget is for prevention. Um, nevertheless, a huge fraction of cancer actual uh, on the ground uh, that works is preventative, avoiding UV, smoke, um, certain uh, pathogens, and so forth. Now, speaking of pathogens, I'm, um, I'm recovering for 11 days of some respiratory illness, and uh, and when you see someone cough, you wonder, gee, is that nothing? Is that non-infectious, like an allergy or neural reflex? Or is that, um, you know, some deadly um, disease uh, heading my way? And I think when we start talking about environmental uh, components, and, and I will talk about environmental engineering, it'd be nice to have a real-time wearable um, device that tells you exactly what's going on in your air, your water, your food, your environment. And there is something that's close to that, which is this nanopore technology. There are two t nanopore technologies. The, the portable one here, the handheld one, is Oxford nanopore, and there's another one in development by Genia Roche. And this is, is actually not quite real time, but it's pretty close, 25 minutes from the time you uh, put in your sample to getting the first DNA sequence. 
Now, that's reading your environmental components, and, and microbiome is a huge fraction of your environment, but you can also engineer your microbial environment. And here's an example of five companies I happen to be involved in that deal with everything from um, uh, detoxifying, if you have some toxins in your body, to, either due to uh, inborn errors of metabolism and so forth, there's skin health, there's um, uh, actually some of the brain metabolites are made um, by the microbiome. Your microbiome is in your gut is in equilibrium with your body. That's why you, many of these things happen. And finally, there's if you take antibiotics, you can end up with way too much Clostridium difficile, which is a ser serious dysbiosis, which you can fight by fecal transplants, which are not very well controlled. They're typically, you know somebody who has some poop that you can use. And <laughs> Ceres is trying to make this something that FDA can get behind, a uh, reproducible. Re now, in or now there's, in addition to the sequencing method I described, that portable sequencing, there's another revolutionary kind of sequencing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which is uh, the, our ability to read in situ. And this is an example of, uh, you know, a bulkier instrument. It's basically a modified microscope, a custom, that allows you to read every part of a, a cell, DNA, RNA, and protein. And you can see each of these dots is changing color, not position. Its position is fixed. Then, it, then the computer re-displays uh, it in a way that shows that each of those dots now can be read out as a barcode. If you take all the time axis from the previous steps, you can see that. <coughs> Sorry. So you can do this, part of the brain initiative was inspired by this new technology where we can get that kind of fluorescent multicolor readout. Uh, over very large distances, you can track these very large uh, projection and connections or connectome throughout the brain. And, uh, and we're trying to do this to map out the connections the expression of what, you know, what um, molecules are made in the different parts of the brain that makes one cell different from another, and the activity that is associated with the program as it executes in a living, um, behaving brain. This is work from Tony Sater's group with whom we're collaborating on this brain initiative project. Now, you've probably all heard of CRISPR. Uh, somebody raise their hand if you haven't heard of CRISPR. There, it's uh, fewer than the number of people who haven't who've been sequenced. Um, but I and, and I'm and, and I think my team and my uh, ex students uh, have been involved in most of the transformation of it from a discovery, basic science discovery, um, to a um, technology. But I'm going to downplay it a little bit. I'm going to say that's not the revolution. There is a revolution, no doubt about it. I showed you those exponentials. It's the revolution is about omics, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, microbiomics. And it's not just about, it's about reading, writing, and testing, all integrated. They have to be all integrated in order to have an impact on society. We've launched a new project that goes far beyond editing to writing. You can think of editing as you change one, one letter in a book, in, in best cases. Uh, but what about writing the book from scratch? Um, what can we do there? Or what can we do? Can we do editing by, by being able to write um, anything we want? And so one of the things we're trying to do is make human cells that are already used, for, mammalian cells are already used for manufacturing of human protein pharmaceuticals and as stem cell therapies. But we would like to make them virus resistant, prion resistant. Um, I actually have uh, some close friends of mine who have inherited prion disease. Um, we want to make them free of viruses, and I'll show you this in a moment, that, uh, that these viruses that are built into your genome. And the list goes on. Radiation resistance might be of, of interest to uh, space exploration, cancer resistant, and, uh, and so on. Now, to do genome writing or editing, there are nine nanomachines. These are small 
um, enzymes that can be combinations of DNA, RNA, and protein. And what they do is they scan through the genome, your six billion ACs, Gs, and Ts in your genome. They will scan randomly, and they'll make a lot of mistakes, but once they find the right place, they'll make mistakes in scanning, but once they find the right place, they will make uh, a cut, or they will sometimes swap and, and do um, a recombination, it's called. And they, three of them recognize, do that, that needle in a haystack search through six billion different places by uh, using DNA, DNA-DNA uh, interactions, so Watson and Crick, A base pairs with T and G with C. Two of them use RNA with the same rules, and then four use protein DNA interactions to find that needle in a haystack where they're going to do the, the magic of uh, editing or writing. Uh, the latest improvement, I, w I wouldn't say necessarily breakthrough, which is CRISPR-Cas9, but the latest improvement was a fourfold improvement over the previous one. Collectively, it's a revolution. There's no doubt about it. Um, this is, this, we don't need to go through the details of this data, but it was a fourfold improvement in efficiency. We still have two major challenges in genome editing. One is off target and the other is on target. In other words, we don't want this sophisticated nanomachine to be cutting off target where it can get into trouble. In particular, if it cuts off target in a tumor suppressor gene, you could conceivably get cancer. Since, since the computer is involved in designing these things, and this is part of the intimate dance between reading and writing genomes, is you don't just just, you don't just myopically look at what you want to edit and say, I'm just going to edit that, I'm going to ignore the, the other six billion base pairs. You actually say, if I'm going to edit here, is the 20 ACs, Gs, and Ts I'm used to recognize that sequence, the computer is going to design that, is it matching anything else in the genome? Because if it is, that's a bad thing. And in fact, if it's off by one, it's still a bad thing. If it's off by two, it's still bad. Off by three, you can tolerate that, although in best case you test it to make sure that the off by three is adequate. We even have a version of this which is single nucleotide specific, SNP specific. That is to say it can tell the difference of one base pair, but in general you want it to be off by three or more. So that's how one of the ways we do, two of the ways we do with off-target issues. One is computational, the other is SNP specific so-called tuned guide RNAs. Now, on target is even more vexing. Um, you would think, oh, on target, that's good. We're, we're close. You know, we're, that's, that's, that's what it's doing. But what happens is instead of precise editing where you say, I want this G to change to an A, it makes a mess. I call it genome vandalism rather than editing. Um, for some purposes, that's what you want. But for many, that's not what you want. So we're working on ways to go beyond CRISPR and two of them are in this slide here. And what they have in common is rather than making a cut and then hoping that the, that the correct sequence that you've also introduced makes it to that cut before the cell makes a try. The cell is panicking as soon as you break its DNA. It's saying, I got to get that thing back together. And it'll bash it together and make a mess. But a mess is better than a double strand break. Meanwhile, your donor DNA is kind of slotting along there randomly and it doesn't get there in time. But the two that work well is they require that the donor and the acceptor be paired, they touching each other, two DNAs are touching each other before it does any editing. And that results in very precise editing and I think that's what's on the immediate horizon. So if all of you have heard the hype about CRISPR, uh, you can, uh, can one-up one it by saying there is these integrases and recombinases on the horizon. In fact, they're more than on the horizon. We have already used them for the largest genome engineering project ever, two of them actually. One of them is uh, in yeast and the other is in E. coli. Both of these are industrial microorganisms, as you probably know. Uh, they're very useful. Uh, e. coli has a particular problem with viruses, um, as do other industrial microorganisms in the dairy industry and in the mammalian cell culture. And so one of the goals of engineering the genome, and I don't mean just engineering a gene, but every gene in the genome, is so that we can make it resistant to all viruses. I think this is very profound philosophically.
because we're not only, we, we can make them resistant to viruses we haven't even studied, we haven't even seen before. Scientists haven't, um, uh, don't need to have studied them because it, viruses have one thing in common. They have many differences, they have one thing in common, which is they expect the host to provide the translation machinery that goes from DNA to proteins. And that um, is nearly universal and it is certainly uh, expected to have a certain um, properties, the genetic code. If we change the genetic code, we can make it so it doesn't impact the cell because there are synonymous codons, these triplets of A, C's, G's, and T's, triplets uh, that are synonymous, code for the same amino acid. So we can make the cell accepting, but the virus wasn't in on the game as you made, changed the code. So anyway, we've, we've now done that. Um, change the code genome-wide in one organism and we're in the process of changing it more radically and changing it in other organisms. This is one of the other organisms. The previous winner for the, the race for the fastest replicating organism, E. coli, which you've all heard of, is on the right there. And the new winner, um, which might be a little alarming to you, is Vibrio nitrogens, which we've now engineered to be almost as good as E. coli at everything that we consider the standard molecular biology toolkit, plus it's better than E. coli at replicating, as you can see from that little movie. Um, and a lot of what we do is aimed at, at safety, biocontainment and uh, genetic and metabolic isolation was, was one of the things that comes out of that geno genome engineering genetic code change. Now, when we start to apply this genome project right, um, whether it's editing or larger scale writing for the human genome, uh, we, we have to think very deeply about testing as well. Um, and this is, uh, can go in two directions. If you think of, notes that on many of the things in our genomes, many of the DNA sequences in our genome are neither deleterious nor normal. They're just different. They vary a lot. Uh, some of them don't matter. Some of them produce diversity that's wonderful. Um, but let's take a case where you have a disease allele, which we'll call deleterious. And we can, with genetic writing, um, we can change the deleterious allele to the normal allele. And we can do this in an adult, in the correct tissue, and that's typically called gene therapy. And we have a gene therapy test pipeline, and, and, you'll, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Almost exactly the same pipeline can go from normal cells to deleterious mutations in those genomes. And this is uh, addressing a growing diagnostic need, which is that as you um, sequence everybody in this room that isn't sequenced and everybody in the world, you find a large number of things that look potentially pathogenic or, or, or alarming. Now, there are three million differences between you and me, and uh, not all, most of those are, are neutral. Um, but you, d you don't necessarily know right away, so you need a, a way of quickly determining which ones are serious and which ones are not. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, what we need in order to do this, we need properly consented cells. We need a way of doing not only genome engineering I've been talking about, but epigenome engineering, meaning turning the way the cell is expressed on and off to make a particular cell type because the mutation may affect blood cells but not skin cells or vice versa. And finally, I, I, I really want to emphasize this, you need to have genome sequencing before you do it and after to make sure you get, got the right thing. Now this is the epigenome engineering. And you start out with a little pig pile, you saw how closely packed they were in little dots of cells, they loved each other as stem cells. <coughs> These are these are stem cells from my body, by the way. No embryos were hurt in this. And uh, no students were impacted either. Uh, the, the, uh, Alex mm, is a graduate student. Uh, and, and what's happened here is those stem cells that love being together um, uh, flew apart and became neurons of a very specific type, bipolar neurons. And we can make neurons of many different types. Um, and many other things that are present in the brain that you're not neuron, which includes the cells, the blood vessels, cells around the blood vessels, the so-called glia, and the, and the cells that are responsible 
for um, putting a myelin sheath around your axons to make super fast transmission of electrical signals. And we've learned how to do this. We've made a library of uh, factors that help us do this in a very systematic way. Now, I mentioned those cells came from me, but we have other cells and other data sets which are open, uh, and we're highly, I'm very um, indebted and delighted to ha be part of this sharing community globally in uh, five different countries. And these are some of the volunteers in that project, which is the only open access um, project in the world where people share their genomic environmental and trait data, as well as the cells for projects like the ones we've been talking about so far. That, that project, the Personal Genome Project, has been recognized by the NIST and the FDA here. Um, this town should appreciate exactly how important those two institutions are. And it's not every day that they collaborate with each other. They did in this case to establish a uh, genome and bottle project to, to provide standards worldwide for for the, uh, uh, if anybody needs uh, a genome, they want to be able to use the same genome that everybody else in the world is using. So there's a standard genome, standard cells, standard data. Um, and so anybody that develops a new technology, a new diagnostic procedure or um, instrument can, can all get these uh, standardized. Uh, cells. And they, they found that our project was the only one in the world that had been, the individuals had been properly consented um, for this kind of project. Now here's, here's what I was getting at earlier about how you can run it one way where you go from deleterious mutations to normal, that's gene therapy, running it from normal mutations to deleterious, it allows you to get at variance unknown significance. It allows you to, to determine whether a mutation you think looks dangerous in a diagnostic setting is or is not in a particular um, uh, tissue. So in this particular case, this little boy had uh, severe cardiomyopathy. Um, these methods, I should mention, work with as little as an N of one. You know, you often will hear that you need to have 10,000 patients, 10,000 controls in order to get good correlation. This goes beyond correlation to cause and effect. It let you, need, you can now get um, very convincing data, in a way more convincing than correlation, by showing that a particular base pair, not one of the three million differences between me and this young boy, but one base pair. And so what we did was we took my cells, which are ostensibly normal, I assure you they're not, um, and changed uh, one of the top candidate uh, 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 positions. So this one G on the X chromosome in the TAS gene uh, was deleted in this boy. And there, although there are many things that could have caused the various um, problems, that was one worth testing. And that's what is illustrated here is that we made um, a one base deletion, remove that G, didn't affect the other six billion base pairs. And we know that because um, people in my lab think nothing of they change one base pair, they sequence the whole six billion to make sure they change that one and nothing else. Uh, it tells you really how far we've come from the days when we used to agonize as to whether we could afford to sequence 20 base pairs. Uh, we now think nothing of sequencing six billion. Um, and, we now, and it also illustrates how that even though all the off-target, on-target things I was complaining about a little while ago, if you have a procedure by which you can get a clone, meaning that you can take um, a clump of cells, like I showed in that movie earlier, and disaggregate them into single cells, and each of those single cells produce its own little clump of cells, then each of those cells is more or less equal within the clones, and if you analyze it, you can determine the, the sequence of the rest, and that allows you to get nearly perfect editing, and that's what we have here, is we have a clone that is perfectly edited. That's very different than many of the other gene therapy scenarios where you will treat a billion cells and each of them has a slightly different um, history and outcome. I think this is a very promising way of not only doing the, the diagnostic search, but also doing therapeutic. Anyway, we changed this one base pair, and then we used, that's the genetic engineering part, and then we did epigenetic engineering, where we turned those stem cells from my left arm into um, 
cardio, cardiac tissue. So this is now this beautiful repeating structure, sarcomere repeat, just like cardiac tissue. This thing beats uh, spontaneously uh, if, it's, if it's the normal. But if you change one base pair, you now simultaneously change the lipid biochemistry, the mitochondrial function, the morphology, and the contractile nature, all in ways that are consistent with the um, medical phenotype of this young boy. So I, this um, cons consisted of pretty convincing proof that that one G on an X chromosome in the TAS gene was sufficient to cause this genetic disease. So that, caught, that was uh, something you can do on, with information from one child. A nasty, sorry, dirty little secret about the human genome is we have never sequenced the human genome. I'm sorry you heard it from me. Um, but many of my colleagues have claimed that we have or obfuscated the fact that there are parts of the human genome that are not yet sequenced. Many of the hardest parts are in the repeat regions. These are regions where you have the same stretch of sequence over and over, sometimes as short as two base pairs, sometimes as long as millions of base pairs over and over with slight variations. We hope to finally sequence the human genome. I won't declare victory until we've sequenced it many times over from many people. We haven't done it from one yet. But anyway, our lab is not only sequencing these hard parts of the genome, but we are engineering them as well, because I think that's how you get true understanding of such regions. And uh, many of these are involved in cancer and aging, and so that these are not junk DNA. You know, my colleagues might have a sour grapes attitude, which is if they were so important, we would have sequenced them by now. Um, kind of. And here's first example of us engineering uh, repeat elements um, genome-wide for a very valuable reason. And this is, it turns out, almost every mammal has endogenous retroviruses in the genome. This is not a hygiene thing. This is not something where these pigs, in this case, um, uh, caught this from the environment. This is something that all pigs are born with these porcine endogenous retroviruses. That's not my acronym. Um, um, and this is, a this is a phylogenetic tree showing um, how distant related some of these endogenous retroviruses are. We picked the most conserved part, meaning the part where the GSA TCCs have changed the least over these millions of years that these endogenous retroviruses have been co-evolving with the major part of the pig, pig genome. And we picked a highly conserved part in the polymerase gene. We didn't want to touch the envelope gene, which is thought to be involved in placental health um, during the development of the pig. And, uh, and then we eradicated them. And you might be wondering, why are you, you know, okay, I understand that you, want, you have this thing about rep repetitive elements and finishing genomes, but why are you doing this particular one? And the reason is that the humanization of pigs was a very promising technology 20 years ago, long before we were involved in this field. And it was shut down correctly by the FDA after about $2 billion investment um, because of these endogenous retroviruses, largely. These would um, leave the pig organs, in principle, and go into the immune-compromised recipient. You're often immune-compromised if you're a transplant recipient of any type. And then, you can imagine that these pig viruses, which don't hurt pigs, um, will infect, they don't infect pig cells, but they will infect human cells, and, uh, and then it will spread from human cell to human cell because they're not uh, prepared to um, be resistant to them. So that was considered a showstopper by the FDA, and I think quite correctly. And so when we entered the field with our little um, CRISPR scissors, we thought, well, um, let's, let's face that up front, um, while we're doing the humanization of the immune system and the carbohydrates and the complement and so forth, uh, let's make sure that we, we're not going to have the showstopper again after 20 years. And, um, and what really surprised us is that it took 14 days. After 20 years and $2 billion, it took us 14 days and some cheap uh, growth media to, to eliminate all 62 endogenous retroviruses from the pig genome. So these are the first pigs, pig cells in the world to um, 
n not have any in active endogenous retroviruses. And then we've made, um, we've gone on to do this again and uh, have taken them through development. So, and we also have engineered the immune system, so hopefully it will be compatible enough so that now we can, we hope to do transplants into humans within a year. And this is something that could affect millions of people worldwide. Um, for almost every organ we currently transplant from human to human, including heart, kidneys, liver, lungs, intestine, uh, eyes, skin, heart valves, and so on. Now, one thing I like about this, aside from the obvious helping of uh, uh, millions of people, is, it, is the way that it makes us rethink uh, prevention, preventative medicine I mentioned earlier. Because if I want to develop a radical new preventative medicine on you, the healthy people, um, that's hard because really I can only do harm to you in a, an immediate sense. I might promise you something down the road, but the immediate impact is potentially negative. So it's hard to do that. On the other hand, if you need an organ transplant, then it behooves me to give you the best possible organ I can. And so I can offline, without affecting any humans, I can develop pigs which are uh, capable of producing organs that are slightly better than, um, than merely um, missing their pervs and, and uh, humanized immune system. And that means that we can make, in principle, we can a attempt at least to make pathogen resistant, cancer resistant, aging resistant pig organs. And then we can get practiced at this, which I would consider preventative medicine. So uh, we have a number of such projects going on and there's evidence in the literature from a variety of, of groups in a, in, in a variety of model organisms. Again, like CRISPR, it's the basic, basic science that got us here and then we technologists just pick up where the basic science left off. Is in fruit flies and worms and mice, you can find ways of getting longevity where you can get up to two to ten times longer lifetimes depending on the organism. Two to ten, imagine living two to ten times longer than the longest person in your family. Um, and here's uh, examples of some literature citations where, for example, uh, blood from an, a younger mouse will rescue um, and reverse many different uh, cell types and many different measurements of reversal. Uh, and this has been reproduced by many labs. There's also the same factors that we use for reprogramming my arm skin cells into embryo-like cells that we showed, I showed you earlier, you can do that we do in the lab in the, in the single cells, but you can also do that in a mouse and that shows, and I'm quoting here, in vivo amelioration of age-associated hallmarks by partial reprogramming. So we're taking these observations from model organisms and we're moving them into um, gene therapies not into small molecule drugs, as might be the temptation of pharmaceutical companies, but gene therapies turn out to be much easier. We, we made 45 gene therapies in the course of a few months with just two postdoctoral fellows working on this. Um, based on the, some of the genes I've been talking about already, plus others in this aging gene database. And these have been tested in mice and some of them have already uh, moved on to being uh, tested in dogs, where there is a uh, an interest in veterinary therapies and it's much easier to get FDA approval for such things. I'll just show you one example. This is a uh, mitochondrial pathway. Here, mice, when they go from a young mouse, which is six months old, to a really, really old mouse, which is 22 months old, um, this particular chemical, this, this uh, NAD involved in mitochondrial function, drops by about a factor of two. And so we wanted to, to, to change the pathway by doing um, activation, I won't go through the details here, but the activation of a particular activator. So this transcription factor, uh, TF, TFAM, um, we, used, we used CRISPR not to cut it or to kill it, but to activate it. And, uh, and we found empirically of four different places we checked, one of them improved at 48-fold. Remember, we're just trying to get a two-fold effect. 48-fold in the protein, and about eightfold in the NAD 
the, the small molecule that we wanted to improve by twofold. So this looks very promising, and this is just one of, of 45 different gene therapies that we're um, trying. There's a, a possible dark side to this, which is that um, some people aren't waiting for FDA approval. Uh, so these are two people that are, that are well-known. I'm not outing them or anything. They, they have been uh, published um, by Tech Review. Um, who independently of each other and independently of me, I, in fact, I discouraged them from doing this, um, and, and, and uh, not necessarily even with deep scientific know-how in one case, um, just ordered uh, on the internet uh, adeno-associated virus with uh, containing genes involved in aging. Uh, these three genes mentioned here, folostatin, tel telomerase, and growth hormone releasing hormone, and injected themselves with it. They fortunately did not die, um, and I, you know, I, think I take this very seriously. But uh, it shows how far we've come and how cheap these things are becoming and how small the barrier is to trying it out. I also show on the slide that you can do, um, your kids are out buying CRISPR kits um, for $150 and probably less. And these kits assume no existing ex equipment Include, even assume you don't have access to gloves, so there's, there's gloves there. Um, so do you know what your kids are doing right now, right? Um, there is the inevitable discussion of uh, germline therapy. Um, uh, <clears throat> I had been not advocating but, but describing a potential uh, slippery slope or possible uh, that might uh, be a particularly attractive. It was easy, it's too easy, in fact, I caution against dismissing a new technology, say we don't need to worry about that because nobody wants to do it, or we don't need to worry about that because it's not technically feasible, both of which were used for germline therapy. And I think that was, um, that doesn't allow us to address in advance. It puts us in a position where it the technology advances very quickly um, and we're not ready for it. So the scenario that I created that I, th I think is more realistic and deserves attention and was eventually given attention in the National Academy of Science report that came out just this past February is the idea that if you have parents, let's say two unaffected carriers, they have one good and one bad copy of every gene, bad I mean deleterious for a very serious genetic disease, and they um, about a quarter of their kids um, will either die or be affected for life with this disease. The standard of care right now is uh, either abortion or um, in vitro fertilization where you might make 10 embryos and select one of them, which for right to lifers is uh, the equivalent of uh, death of the embryo. And these are not entirely acceptable uh, alternatives but what if you did uh, engineering of the sperm or the eggs, the gametes? You're not putting any um, embryos at risk, in contrast to the way it's normally framed, and you are potential, and, and you're not even doing anything in vitro at that point. The the, the testes are modified in, a, in an outpatient clinic setting, and you um, and you have uh, the sperm are, are produced, and, and the whole uh, process of reproduction looks uh, from that point on to be like normal reproduction. A second example where you, you, we can be too rash in saying this is not technically feasible, this is not uh, going to happen, uh, it doesn't accelerate, doesn't help us consider the risks if we dismiss. And here the dismissal is of so-called multigenic or complex traits. The you know, textbook case is height. Um, it's not exactly a, a, a terrible uh, medical malady, but it is medically treated. There's, there are about six different diseases which is treated by a single gene, uh, uh, growth hormone or somatotropin, which is, in spite of the fact that there are thousands of genes involved in this complex trait and there are many hundreds of environmental components. Same thing's true for cognition. There are three genes which individually work one gene at a time that have very profound effects on cognitive tasks in mice, 
even though we know that in mice and humans there are hundreds of genes, just like height, that impact it in many environmental components. So to dismiss these and say, oh, it's so complicated we can't understand it and it doesn't affect the biology, I think is naive and, and too dismissal, too much dismissal. So I just want to end on the topic of gene drives. Uh, this is another example, something where we have to take it seriously. We have to talk about it um, broadly. We want to include the entire community. I think it's very important that we have more um, business and political leaders who are very savvy about science. We need more scientists that are very savvy about business and politics. Um, we need to have a discussion of everybody, um, not just those, those people. And, and, the, and, then, and what it is in this case, the stakes are very high on both sides. Um, we want to release into the environment genetically modified organisms. Now you could say, oh, that's a non-starter. People don't even let genetically modified organisms onto the farm, which is kind of an, not really an environmental release. Um, putting them into wilds, wild animals. Uh, I think the difference is that even anti-GMO forces are quite accepting of Medi medical dire need. So ask um, whether anyone is opposed to genetically modified insulin produced, human insulin produced in bacteria or erythropoietin or a variety of human protein pharmaceuticals that are not made in the original organism. These are saving millions of lives. They are very different from genetically modified crops where the the benefit to society is less obvious to the individual in the grocery store. It is not obvious. Here, again, like genetically modified insulin produced in bacteria, these, um, these are cases where you have an, an insect or other um, vector, like a white-footed mouse for Lyme disease, the Anopheles gambii for malaria, Aedes aegypti for um, uh, dengue and Zika and so forth. We would like to make them resistant to these pathogens. Some of these pathogens are human specific, so if we can get rid of them even momentarily, as happened with smallpox, then we need, need never worry about vaccines, drugs, or even gene drives in the future. Many of the things that we're targeting gene drives for, vaccines and drugs have already been tried unsuccessfully sometimes for many decades. How this works, and, and very importantly, when we proposed this um, in 2014 in this paper, we didn't just do the experiment and then plop it on society the way it was done with uh, gain-of-function mutations that cause more serious influenza virus. We, pr we said, let's have a discussion. This is a way we can do it. And more importantly, can we make them reversible? We don't want to talk about a technology until we have some way of making it reversible. There are ways we can have a consensus building, not, not just among the human community, but among the animals um, so that uh, if you're doing an uh, island, for example, you can drive it to extinction while on the mainland it uh, will not happen. And you can make it lo lo local in various ways. And so the standard drive, this is CRISPR here indicated by scissors, will um, cut a DNA, and then this drive is this blue bar, we'll copy over and fix that. Um, and then that repair, now all the offspring have inherited rather than normal, which is 50%. So instead of, instead of like staying at some low level, whatever level you introduced it at, it, it exponentially grows and then plateau, completely fixes, takes over. To reverse it, one way to do that is just to uh, put in another drive that replaces the first one and it'll follow the same um, time series. We have another um, more complicated way where we can keep it constrained in space and time, and this is uh, work from Charleston Noble and others uh, in our consortium. We have uh, four professor groups that are working together here, and, uh, uh, where one, one uh, CRISPR gene drive runs another in a different chromosome, or diff and then, uh, then a third one. and None of these things will spread by itself the way a normal gene drive will, but we call it a daisy chain where one um, is at low levels, it causes the second one to be at higher levels, the third one to be at higher, and eventually they all decay, but at different, uh, 
at different spreads. So you can have something that's local in space and time. So that's an example of how you can discuss these things in advance. We've tested many of these things safely in the laboratory before we even get close to making a decision as to whether uh, these things should be released. But the, but the benefits are quite high. You know, 600,000 people a year dying of malaria. I'm sure some of you know somebody who doesn't like Lyme disease. Um, and the list goes on and on. So I just want to in, open it up for, I know we're going to have lively discussion here. Um, these are some of the people that have helped me do the gene genomically engineered organs um, and uh, work on um, various aspects of, of schizophrenia, bipolar, and so forth that I didn't talk about. Thank you very much. I think there are microphones here and there um, if you have questions or you can shout it out and I'll repeat, repeat it yeah I'll repeat it yes Right, so the, just rephrasing the question a little bit, um, both so everybody can hear it and so I can rephrase it. Um, you know, how general is the, how uh, universal is the genetic code? And if it's been fine tuned over so many years, um, who are we to try to improve on it? Um, the fact is, it's more than just every vertebrate sharing the genetic code. We can move human genes into bacteria. That's about as far as you can go, and they work pretty well. Um, they, they really, sh we share that genetic code. The, there are some small exceptions, but um, for, a, for a class of viruses, you know what code it's expecting. If you, cha if you take that code essentially offline when, it's, when the viruses aren't looking. And so normally what would happen in evolution is the code change, could change, and the viruses would keep up. But if you take it offline, you change it in a way that doesn't hurt the, the organism, the host, and then let the virus come in, the virus is, it can be so radical a change, so many different parts of the virus are broken that it can't even mutate around it. But, but back to your question is, will that work for the host? And the answer is we've changed one organism radically enough so that we've made the first organism in the world that has only 63 of the 64 triplet codons. It doesn't have the, the last one, and it behaves, it seems to behave fine. It, is, it has, it, it, um, when we originally made it, it had a little bit slower growth rate, but it turned out that was not because of the code, but because of um, mistakes that we made along the way we cleaned up. Uh, we've, since then, we've also put that code on back, but as a new amino acid. So now it has 64 again, but it's a new amino acid. That also is healthy. And these are multivirus resistant. So um, my gut feeling is that we can pretty radically change that genetic code to make it not only healthy, but healthier in a competitive environment, which includes infectious agents like viruses. And I think that this strategy should work for every organism that currently has a virus problem. And it includes a lot of industrial, agricultural microorganisms, plants, animals and even humans, or at least human uh, cells used uh, for manufacturing and therapeutics. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> first I was interested in the woolly mammoth project. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Demon. sorry I deprived you so far, but I, I can make up for that. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was wondering whether they were house pets or what you intended. Okay. But anyway, um, first of all, it would seem to me the most efficient place to be doing this is before fertilization, human or otherwise, because you have more leverage. Okay. So you didn't get into the mental aspects a lot, but w my question is, what in your imagination could the human being in terms of appearance and experience and mental, mental um, lifetime kind of experience, what, what could, in other words, what could come of this that's pretty much realistic? What could we expect to see in a, in a future lifetime? Um, so I think you're asking sort of the enhancement question, but from a particular angle, which is where, what's a realistic set? N n for the moment, not being judgmental as to whether it's desirable or not, but where could it go realistically? Um, although it is far, we'll accept that it's speculative. And I will answer the mammoth question as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, uh, they're n the first mammoth, they're not intended to be pets necessarily. Uh, they are, in my opinion, they're like an Asian elephant. They're very close related. They probably would interbreed. Um, Asian elephants an endangered species. Um, one way, of, and it's mostly endangered because it is in conflict, conflict with humans. It's in high human population density. If you could give it the boost of its close relative in ability to, to proliferate and thrive, in cold environments, you now have it now has access to one of the largest unhuman populated ecosystems in the world, uh, such as this vast tundra um, in Canada, Alaska, and Russia, and uh, it would benefit the Asian elephant and potentially and the environment itself. So that's wh where I see it. Not not necessarily in zoos or homes, although I have had many requests for. Pygmy, uh, babe, <laughs> pygmy mammoths, which is almost an uh, oxymoron, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> to back to human enhancement, which is a sort of a related topic. Uh, we're enhancing Asian elephants so they can live in the cold. Um, most of the things that you would want to enhance humans, we've already enhanced with physics and chemistry. Uh, there's no particular reason to make me run faster because I can hop in a 747 or a, you know, Volvo or something and I can go faster than any reasonable runner. Um, what, what is left that we can't fix with you know, rockets and you know, uh, electromagnetic spectrum and so forth is uh, resistance to pathogens, senescence, and things having to do neurocognitive. Um, and those, those are things, and even those, there's a little bit we can do with physics and chemistry and, and biochemistry already. But imagine being resistant to all pathogens. Um, uh, yeah, I mentioned the aging uh, resistance. These will be framed, they won't necessarily be framed as um, enhancements. They will be in, any more than you know, a smallpox vaccine or polio vaccine is, is not framed as an enhancement. It's something that's dealing with a very serious disease. Aging is, the res is 90 percent of us in developed nations will die of a disease that typically doesn't kill 20-year-olds. It's a disease of aging. Um, and so this will be framed in terms of disease, but it most certainly will make us um, able to, um, uh, to survive um, in a new way. Now, the behavioral and cognitive is the biggest thing. We, we can augment that with education, with computers and cell phones and so forth, uh, Google, Wikipedia. But, uh, but our brain uh, could, could itself contain a lot of this information. It could contain new ways of dealing with it. And I don't know where that goes, but um, that's one possibility for something that would be. There are a few others that might make us particularly suited for space exploration, like dealing with microgravity and radiation. Um, again, those might not be considered enhancements because you're gonna be very sick um, if you're in that environment. So a lot of it has to do with 
what is the illness of the environment. Would we expect to live longer? I mean, we'd have a more crowded planet. Right, so if we did, um, uh, let's say, get aging reversal to work, and I think that's a more reasonable FDA approval process than a longevity drug, because if, if you go to the FDA and say, I have a drug that will extend life by 30 years, they say, great, come back in 30 years um, <laughs> with, your, with your data. Uh, but if I say, you know, in, if, you know, here's a two-month trial that shows increased, you know, grip strength and reaction time and so forth, then they say, fine, or resistance to heart disease. So um, if we did, if that, if that resulted, which could be initially th framed in terms of dealing with diseases of aging in an acute sense, but it could result in, in, in longevity, not immortality, but just much longer lives, um, we could have a, a population problem. Um, on the other hand, look at the cities, the cities of the world, all over the world, um, even countries that have high ho population growth have cities that have negative population growth. Um, Japan as a whole country has a, a problem with population growth, and so do in France and a bunch of others. Most of the ones that would have an even bigger problem if it weren't were not for immigration. So. Uh, the fecundity drops from about 7.5 uh, outside the cities to about 1.2 inside the cities, where 2.1 is the replacement rate. So that's one partial solution. The other one, presumably, would be colonization of other planets, which is, if we solve poverty and aging, uh, we might have some excess wealth to um, spend on what doesn't have to be that expensive, uh, an enterprise. Uh, Charles can tell us about that. In the middle there. Hi, uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I had a number of questions. I guess I'll just be brief. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'll, I'll repeat what he has to say. Yeah. Uh, first, you said that the technique that you were, you were applying um, for identification and diagnosis of genetic genetic disorders was more powerful. can be more powerful than correlative, yeah. Uh, to say that it would be possible to actually stop harm and effect. Yes. Could, like, you could go into, like, discount that a little bit more detail. Before you get to your other two questions, let me just repeat this one and answer it, okay? And we might let other people uh, ask some questions, too. So um, the question is, do we have, uh, how does this core, this, uh, cause and effect, how is that better than correlation? And what, what circumstances and, you know, how do, how do we uh, ensure that that's actually working? So let me start with the circumstances where it won't be better. I mean, there are, there are some things that are very hard to test in organoid systems, such as the ones I've been describing. The organoids are getting better and better. They're getting more and more like fully functional systems. But there's some diseases that really require a fully functional integrated a human being, and vary in very subtle ways depending on what you ate that morning and so forth. There's this whole neuroendocrine um, loop um, that's very hard to simulate so far. But I've been amazed at how quickly not only these omics methods are going, genomics methods are going, but also uh, how quickly the organoid methods are going. So I don't know, but th but there are many. There will be many many cases where um, the disease has a molecular, a cellular, and an organ level phenotype, tr you know, where you can see what its effect is. And for those, you will be able to um, have a possibly very high throughput pipeline where as soon as the data comes in that day from all the patients, it goes into maybe several facilities around the world and they go and out comes um, the, the uh, consequences. That's, that's one scenario, but we'll see. Yeah, um, person at the microphone here, and then you. Yes, you had mentioned that you uh, had advised Liz Parrish against her experimentation, but given that some time has elapsed and she seems quite pleased with yeah. her results, have you changed your opinion about that? Well, my opinion wasn't based in any way on her personal plan. It was based on, in this case, we do need 
something a little more than an N of 1 because we're not doing a cause and effect analysis on a person. I mean, it could have been, if it had been a very dramatic, you know, effect, like she turned into Spider Woman or something, <laughs> then N of 1 would have been adequate. But for most uh, realistic, uh, even amazing blockbuster drugs, you need to have a pretty big control uh, cohort. You need um, randomized clinical trials, double-blind placebo control, ideally, um, because there is, there is a potential placebo effect on both of them, um, mm -hmm. on, you know, feeling stronger, feeling healthier, and so forth. So I think that would be my critique, and it stays in place. Uh, we need... And now, the other critique would have been that the, that the, um, the trials were not done with animal trials first, but they were actually both done in animal trials, just not exactly the same drug um, formulation. But it's actually hard for gene therapies to have exactly the same formulation. It's not like a small molecule drug. Um, in particular, gene editing, which today is not what they were doing. Gene editing is very dependent upon the background genome, not only what you're targeting, but what's off target. In any case, I mean, I think that it's, it's a bold move. Uh, <clears throat> there will be required many. Um, well-funded studies to follow up. <coughs> but isn't someone like her moving the field forward by <coughs> taking, uh, taking that kind of risk on herself? Um, I wouldn't say she's putting, she could put the field backwards by, by having a bad outcome. Okay. Um, she might be moving it forward. She certainly, you know, she might be, I think the field is moving forward very quickly uh, without, even before uh, Brian and Liz started doing this. Uh, I don't want to in any way in undermine what they're doing. I think it's terrific that they are engaged. I just think that they should uh, uh, raise enough money so they can do at least uh, one control uh, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think the field is going to go f forward very quickly. Um, I do. Uh, unless something bad happens. And so that was, that was me worrying. Okay. about them and the field, as happened with gene therapy. So one person died in Pennsylvania and two people died in Europe in around the year 2000, and that set the field of gene therapy back by 10 years. And you might say, well, you know, three people die a lot in clinical trials, but what, they don't die a lot when so, a brand new technology is coming along. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Thank you. Um, did you still have a question? Ah, right. So the que the question of gene therapy uh, cures. So there are quite a few. There's 23, 2,400 gene therapies have been approved for clinical trials. Um, a few of them are getting cl either have been approved, uh, fully approved, but made it through phase three clinical trials, or are getting close to that. Some of them are curing people with, in phase one, which is pretty amazing. Um, some of them fa cured so many people, kids of blindness in phase one, there's almost nobody left because it's a very rare uh, genetic disease. Um, you know, I think, I think uh, if we're cautious, gene therapy may turn out to be one of the most easily programmed, easily, you know, m transition from basic facts to therapies and uh, very um, safe. But it's still not, I mean, we haven't, it hasn't been proven in enough cases yet, so I think we need to proceed cautiously. One last question back here. I'm sorry, there's a few hands, but, yeah. Right. 
So, so two questions here about uh, eliminating viruses. Um, and what, uh, let's start with uh, whether let's start with the easy technical one, which is uh, can we if we made a cell that was resistant to viruses at the genetic code level, would it also be resistant to viruses where you're trying to deliver a payload? This, I'm not even talking about gene therapy, just in a very generic sense. And this could be any organism, bacteria, animals, whatever. And the answer is that the, typically when your virus is delivering a payload, that payload can be engineered to be whatever you want. It can be engineered to have the ge genetic code of the, of the new cell, the new genetic code. Also, the virus capsid itself is already made before you deliver it. So it can, it can be made with whatever code it wants, uh, uh, incompatible code, but the protein still works. So the code is only about a nucleic acid going to a protein in the recipient cell. And so you, you could have like a capsid made with the old code delivering a messenger RNA with a new code. So that all works. That's the technical question. <coughs> You're slightly more philosophical or, or, or question that m maybe we don't have enough data for is uh, how valuable might viruses be? You, we can start with how vi viable microorganisms might be. And, there, and, and we kind of went from a, a world where everybody felt all microbes were bad. Well, first, we didn't even know about microbes. Then all microbes are bad, pathogens. And then, well, some of them might, might be good to, um, they're so good you can't live without them. Um, that's going to kind of the history of the science. And, and I would say that went too far because there are examples uh, almost every animal we've tried, I mean, I'm putting aside maybe termites and cows, every, you know, every major, you know, goats, chickens, uh, rodents, and even humans, you can eliminate all their microbiome as far as we know, and they will sur they'll, be, they'll survive. Um, so it's not absolutely essential for life. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily we've settled whether they thrive or not. I mean, they, they're, they're probably fine. Um, viruses, they might be in there and we're not noticing them. I mean, that's a, that's a reasonable way out. Um, but I think that if that were the case, then you could probably, if you, if you find that virus, it's essentially, it's probably, it's not like a vast number necessarily. It could be one virus, one bacterium that's really, really helps you to thrive rather than just survive. Um, you could probably simulate that, um, with either a vaccine or actual that pure virus. But that's speculation. We, the point is there is some definitely some ignorance there. It's not vast ignorance, but there is ignorance. So. Dr. Church, on behalf of, is this, is, can you hear me? On behalf of the Science, Council of Scientific Society Presidents, the Cavalier Foundation, and the Carnegie Institute for Science, we thank you for your talk. We thank the audience. We thank the audience for their attention, and I will tell you that normally we would have turned the lights up, but the same gremlin that had affected the microphone has apparently infected the lights, and we're afraid if we turn them up, we'll lose them entirely. So be very careful as you leave. All right? So thank you for coming. Good night.